Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cape Cod Technology Council's First Friday. I'm Bert Jackson, CEO, and today we have Chris Bender from the North Cross, North Cross Group as our guest uh, and want to acknowledge uh, our First Friday series speaker, Open Cape, providing uh, pure fiber broadband uh, to the Cape Cod region. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, turn this over to our moderator today, uh, owner of Cape Space, Vice President, Vice President of the Cape Cod Technology Council Board of Directors, Robin Orbison. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to First Friday. Happy October. Um, and uh, it is my pleasure this morning to welcome our speaker, Chris Bender. Um, Chris um, is with the North Course Group, which is a consulting firm based in Portland, Maine. Um, and he has um, uh, done this presentation on cybersecurity uh, here on the Cape uh, previously for the Cape Cod Chamber. And we scarfed him up for Tech Council repeat uh, performance. So good morning, Chris. I was still good morning and glad there to be here. Go. Thank you. Okay. All right. Welcome. So um, I'm just going to let you um, go start uh, launch your presentation and we'll, um, we'll go from there. Uh, if people have questions, um, please feel free to drop them into the chat at any point and we will break uh, uh, periodically and during the presentation to answer them. Uh, so take it away, Chris. Great. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here with you. I'm very happy that you chose to join a discussion on cybersecurity at eight in the morning on a nice starting a fall Friday morning. I would think there might be some other things to do, but hopefully we'll give you some good information as we walk through some of these things that can be helpful to you with your businesses and with your career development and things of that sort. So hopefully there's some value for you here. So what we're going to be talking about are cyber threats. And what we're going to try to do is talk to this in the context of cyber threats facing small businesses, um, small teams, people working remotely, things of that sort. As we go through, and as Robin indicated, we can certainly dialogue and deviate a little bit from some of the things that are here in the presentation slide. Um, just as a little bit of background, uh, NCG or the North Cross Group, we're an integration and cybersecurity firm. We work in uh, the commercial space. We also work in the federal space. A good number of our folks have uh, uh, background and we worked in uh, both the de defense and civilian sides on the federal space in things like cybersecurity. And now we do uh, a lot of work also in the commercial space, primarily when banking and finance, transportation, healthcare, and uh, utilities, and a handful of other industries. One of the things, though, that has kind of happened to us is that we've been called in uh, to help with uh, organizations which really weren't having to deal a whole lot with serious cyber threats in terms of ransomware, malware. We, we've had viruses and things like that for years, and that's always been uh, a pesky thing for organizations. But the the depth and breadth of the types of things that organizations of all sizes, single-person outfits, three-person outfits, small businesses are facing has really ramped up over the past year and a half, two years. Uh, I've been in the cyberspace for a little over 32 years, and I've never seen the volume uh, like we're seeing right now. And so the things we're going to talk to about talk about today are things that everyone who runs a business today should be aware of. Actually, some of the things we're going to, most of the things we're going to talk about are things that everyone uh, living in this country need to pay attention to because of the use and interaction we have with technology, whether it's banking, making reservations for a restaurant, checking on play dates for kids or whatever it may be technology and that infrastructure is so intimately tied into everything we do. And as a business, that's how we interact with customers. That's how we conduct financial transactions. That's how we deal with suppliers and all those other things. And all of those are potential vectors for people to exploit. And there are a lot of folks out there who are spending a lot of time doing that. And, um, Anecdotally, while most of us have been working from home and not moving around as much as we've gone and been dealing with this uh, COVID stuff, uh, people aren't out on the streets getting mugged as much, but they're uh, getting becoming victims of various types of identity theft, account takeovers, various other types of things that are out there. And that volume and that vector for criminals and people looking to cause mischief is certainly there. So those are things we're going to talk about this morning as we, we jump in. So let's let's get started. So what we want to kind of cover today is some of the basic things to help understand what some of the threats are 
out there. Uh, talk a little bit about how some of the security through obscurity uh, that has been practiced by some small companies uh, traditionally, we're too small. No one's going to care about us. We're located somewhere that's not a focus area. That's not really the case. Um, we did some work with the city of Portland, I think it was about uh, 14, 15 years ago, and we were having a conversation with some of the folks who run their infrastructure, and they said, you know, we're Portland, Maine. Who's really going to be concerned with us? Um, there are so many other targets here in New England, Boston, going down to New York, things of that sort. Um, we, we really don't have too much concern, and we said, well, let's take a little experiment. Let's take your network, your public facing network, and put a new computer up on it and see how long it takes for someone to start trying to get into it. And they said, yeah, you we know, have a couple weeks, a month, stuff like that. And we said, I bet within an hour you will see things on there. So we plugged in, in a we were in a meeting conference room just across the street in City Hall and we plugged a computer in, put it right out on the internet and put a monitor up there. It took 18 minutes before we had activity from China coming in and, and looking at them. And it was one of those things, so I guess this was 2006. It was rather eye-opening for them that they would be a target for that. You know, that same type of metaphor applies now to someone who's running a art studio, someone who's running a yoga studio, someone who's doing a one person consulting uh, company that's interacting with different clients, you need to understand where your exposure is, where things are that can hurt you in this area, what you can do to prevent them. And we'll talk about these. And some of the things we'll talk about with uh, prevention and response plans will vary a little bit based on uh, the order of magnitude of your organization the infrastructure you have and the resources you have, but we'll try to talk to some of these things in a way that can help scale some of the thought process so that everyone can take advantage of this or for you to help your partners, your clients, your customers, what have you as you go forward. Okay, so the uh, current threat environment, obviously there's been things that have been going on in the um, uh, local area that you've seen about, the, we've got the ferry service item here, but the current threat environment is that you have a lot of bad actors, whether they're domestic or international, they're taking advantage of a lot of different things. There've been a lot of strains on the economy, dealing with the COVID piece, people working remotely, supply chain problems, things of that sort. Uh, whenever there is confusion, whenever there is there are changes, whenever there are things that are variants in different types of environments, things that are secure versus unsecure, and those interacting, there's opportunity for exploitation, and that is happening. Um, the other thing is people are making money off this, uh, especially with things with ransomware. Even in small numbers, it doesn't cost them to do this. So they're putting things out there and they are making money. And as long as they are making money and they're able to sell things that they steal, people will continue and it will continue to grow. Um, there's also some new tactics going on. Some of the things were uh, very focused on uh, trying to prevent people from having access access to things or compromising the integrity of things. Now we actually have things that where people are stealing stuff. So for instance, organizations have data that might be locked and they can't use get, get to it through some type of ransomware. What they're also finding is that the the terms that they're being offered are pay up and or we won't give you the key to unlock it and also pay up and you better do so in a re this given time period or we're going to start either giving away or selling your information to embarrass you or to embarrass your clients or whatever it may be and the thing is is some people are paying it um, and they're looking at the options of paying the price that's being asked versus rebuilding which is challenging and expensive which puts people in a bad situation and if they're not prepared they may not have a viable way to rebuild and so they do have to do that We'll talk a little bit about theories of paying ransoms and that kind of stuff a little later on, but those are some of the many things that are kind of buzzing around, and we'll go to a couple of uh, more examples as we go through this, but I want to talk a little bit of some of the specific vectors uh, uh, and factors that we see with small businesses. Um, one of the things is, is the high dependence on the internet uh, with the way people do business, whether to interact with customers, deal with suppliers, do their finances, things of that sort. Almost everything that you, you do and anyone who you're dealing with, whether you're running a food truck, or you're running a small business, or you're running a, a mid-sized or even a large corporation, technology plays a lot into it. And it's being used by everyone there. And it's being used with people using corporate and business devices, but also their personal devices, which are getting very commingled. And that's 
part of also the evolving engagement models we have. Like we're all sitting here on Zoom. Uh, a couple of years ago, I guess now is the time frame. Uh, we'd probably be in a conference room meeting, and we're talking about that just when we started. Um, people are using multiple different ways of communicating and it ranges from doing things like zoom meetings using file transfers using email using texting using various apps using browser-based technologies and those are all interacting with each other and that diversity of the way we communicate bring in a lot of variables into how we interact and some of the vectors with all of that is that we have direct channels now where people are interacting with consumers, with business partners that are entirely electronic. And that's a little bit different than opening your front door and having someone walk through and having the bell over the door ring as they come in and uh, having them walk up to your cash register. Uh, it's a different model and it's new. Um, and it's something that affects everyone. It's, it's how we operate. It's our, how our third parties operate, how our vendors operate. Um, and it's it's endemic to that point it's also something we need to consider with things like supply chain and fourth parties what we mean by that is who are the people that we depend on who do they depend on who do they use to do some of those things i'm sure you've seen uh, media reports earlier in the year with things like solar winds and kaseya the the direct impact on their given software was was one thing it's all the people who are using that software and all the services that they provide and the opportunity that it, those um, issues had for other people to get into those is where the real story is. And it's that cascading effect. And like we've talked about COVID, a lot of these things kind of spread more like a virus. It moves from place to place to place and any conduit it has to move, it goes through. So keeping in mind that the way we do business today is very different than what was just two years ago and certainly five or 10 years ago and understanding that and how we interact with people and all those ways that people can get to things like your data, information, access to create transactions and do things like in your banking or payroll. Those are all very important to understand as you look at what you need to protect and how you're going to go about protecting it. So let me pause there. Any initial questions anyone has uh, before we move forward? Um, I don't see any. Oh, this is me. Uh, hold on. There I am. <laughs> I don't see any audience questions, but I'd like yep. to um, just uh, get a clarification on, on your first slide there, Chris, um, you know, talking about the environment. Um, do you directly attribute the recent, uh, you know, uptick in this kind of activity to, um, to the pandemic? It happens to coincide with that time frame. There are two pieces with it that are were accelerants for it. One was the fact that people were you, relying on online channels, so like Zoom and communicating electronically because they weren't interacting directly with each other. And you had businesses shift into working into remote modes. Businesses and organizations for years have worked on protecting their local area networks, their offices and things of that sort remote working was something that certain groups did and there were certain ways to protect it but we never we didn't have the volume of people working in that type of mode that we did until we went into some of the lockdown provisions so you, you had that and businesses shifted the way that they worked with each other the way that their employees were working and so you had a lot more utilization of that infrastructure than you did previously we were moving in that direction anyway but that was certainly one of the factors. The other thing that was happening is there was things were changing. There was confusion. There were people didn't know if they were worried about their health. They were worried about whether they were going to be able to get toilet paper next week type of thing. They were worried about um, what if they'd be able to order supplies for certain things and whether their kids would be going off to college or not. Those, whenever there's things that people are worried about or thinking about and distracting them, for anyone who wants to try to do something bad to you, that's a great opportunity. So you had the infrastructure change, you had the focus of people's attention change, and you had, um, as we have been experiencing, probably going back more closer to the past 20, 25, 30 years or so, we continue to get better and better technology. The things that are out there, the software, the capabilities with artificial intelligence, uh, uh, robotic process automation, you don't have to sit there and type keys in to try to hack into something. Um, if, for those old enough on here, if you remember the movie War Games with the kid who was sitting there with his computer and his dial-up modems and such, um, you don't have to even do that. You press a button 
button and you can cascade something that's interacting with computers globally and it will run as fast as the processing power you have to drive it and how fast it can just make its way through networks. There is very little cost, there's very little effort to do that. So it provides easy opportunity. So we were moving in that direction anyway. It's certainly, I think the pandemic was a catalyst for it. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I think I'll let you continue. All right, so some of the threats that are out there, one of the ones that are very important, and there's there's many, and we'll, we'll give you some resources where you can look into some things, but the ones that I think are really important, especially for uh, smaller organizations, are some of the things with social engineering. Um, the, these are things where people are trying to manipulate people into doing something um, that they're not intending to do. Um, and they use different things like, and we have some of the tactics here of authoritative direction. And so just telling someone to do something. When people, especially if you're interacting with the public, if you are getting a call as a business from a potential customer, with someone providing some type of direction, our natural inclination is to be supportive and to be helpful. And that's what people do. Um, if you see someone walking towards the door of a building carrying something and you're about to go in, you hold the door open so they can walk in. That's great. Hopefully that person was supposed to be there and they weren't someone who was trying to sneak in just by carrying something and taking advantage of you trying to be a, a nice person. Um, those are tactics that are used in a, the physical sense. They also happen in the electronic sense with people sending messages, calling up on the phone, interacting with people. Um, other tactics are things with urgency and timeliness. This is something that needs to happen. So don't dawdle, don't go and double check things, things of that sort. Um, they want you to try to do something quickly. Uh, and those are also things that people exploit. Again, when people feel that there's a sense of urgency, they need to do something quickly or something's going to expire and or it could hurt someone. They feel that they need to respond and you start to discount some of the things that you might do to cross check and validate it. Um, preying on helpfulness, uh, things where people, they want to do something good. They want to help. They're worried about what's happening in society or to their families or their people's health, things like that. It's just very difficult to discern what is real and what isn't real sometimes when you're dealing with electronic formats. Things can be made to look very legitimate and very correct and right, um, but they may not be. So you got to look at how you can empower your teams to know what are the things that we can do to make sure that these don't happen to us and we're not taken advantage by any of these. And the people they target are people that are new staff, part-time staff, uh, people in the customer service space, but also people who deal with business business interactions. So things like accounting groups, ordering groups, supplier groups, things of that sort, where you do have that interaction with a broad group of entities, whether they be customers or businesses, and again, your natural or first inclination is to be supportive and helpful and not necessarily on your guard. And people who want to cause harm or do bad things, they realize that and they will take advantage as they go through it. So the social engineering concepts are things that have been evolving in sophistication rapidly over the years, and they've gotten pretty darn good at this point. And there's no way that you can go through a, a memorization activity of all the things that are out there, but they are tactics and things that you should be familiar with and make sure your team and staff are familiar with them as well. So let's talk a little bit about malware and ransomware in particular, because this has been pretty ran uh, rampant uh, of the past year and a half or so. So malware and ransomware are pieces of software that are downloaded primarily by someone clicking on something, visiting something, opening an attachment, uh, looking, opening, or displaying a picture in a given channel that puts some type of information or conducts some sort of action on your device. So what it does is it's looking to steal information, to take information from you, from your device, or ask you to write it and actually type it in. You might be thinking you're logging into your online banking, but you're not, and so you're giving someone your user ID and password to your online banking uh, information. Um, some of the things it does is encrypt information, not to protect it as it's going somewhere, but so that you can't use it and causing that stuff to be uh, unusable. The other thing it does, uh, it sometimes tends to spider out and distribute other 
bad software or other malware, either on your network to other networks, using your distribution channels to get things out. Um, these are things that, and to our discussion about the pandemic, it's, it's like a viruses too, but malware and ransomware usually designed, unlike a virus, to do a number of different things, and they can be used as tools. They can also be time sensitive so that if something happens and you click on something and you do download something, something may not happen for three months months, six months, and their time sequence so that if you think something unusual happens, your guard starts to go down because nothing's happened immediately. And so you're able, so the, the uh, uh, malware or ransomware is able to sit there and it can do a number of things. Just wait. It can observe, look for more interesting things, build a profile of what you do to figure out how can it best exploit you. Is it simply just using you as a distribution point or are you something that has something of value to them, something like healthcare information or monetary transactions? actions and things like that. Um, the how you get these things in general, uh, email phishing, so things that are coming in through emails, um, people clicking on links, opening up attachments, going to websites that might be masquerading websites and not really what they are. And then on your devices, it's having various types of software vulnerabilities and poor access controls, which also means that a lot of these things are very preventable. And there's a lot you can do to minimize the potential that you're, you're impacted by this. On the right-hand side, just some listing of things. Looking at the list, going through it is really not... Uh, all that important. There's just a lot of weird type of naming conventions there, but in general, they're all doing similar types of things. They're, they're trying to get some type of software on your devices to do bad things. And what you want to do is do your best to make sure that that software never gets there. And if you do have that software present, you want to make sure you have things in place that can either find it as soon as possible, or isolate it, or take care of it for you. Let me pause there again. Any questions? Um, ha, yeah, Chris, so um, we got some questions coming in about, um, you know, backup and cloud storage, et cetera. And I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to get to that a little bit later in the presentation. So I'm, I'm going to hold off on those questions for now. But um, let me just ask you a question about the social engineering. Um, because, you know, I've been seeing a lot of that myself. And honestly, some of it is just is completely low tech. It's just a, it's just voice on the phone. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this. I mean, you answer the phone and somebody tells you that uh, you have back taxes due to the IRS and you have to, you know, provide a credit card immediately to avoid mm -hmm. having your house seized or something like that. Um, so, you know, they're not even, uh, I mean, they're using plain old telephone service. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so a couple of questions is like, one, what, what are your, what are you seeing with regard to sort of lower tech um, types of, uh, of, of scams. Um, but, but secondly, I just always wonder, um, I mean, in this day and age, I mean, how many people are falling for this? I mean, I, I, I see people do it. I, you know, when we've come close a couple of times ourselves, but, um, you know, where do you think the education is lacking that, you know, so, so many people are, are getting, um, you know, hit by what are becoming commonly known scams? Yep. So most of these are very low tech. And I'm not sure if I'd say it's necessarily fully an education thing as much as it is an awareness thing. And people are getting caught and put in situations where they're not thinking about it. And they're, they're not thinking through what's actually happening here. They're just responding. So it's that perspective piece and taking a step back. Uh, we get paid by folks to try to exploit fairly sophisticated organizations. Um, one of the easiest things to do is, is call the uh, main number and talk to someone. You spend two minutes on someone's website, figure out what kind of business they're in. Um, and I've been able to get through all sorts of different things and all sorts of different types of organizations, which are very highly sophisticated, very well trained, and people who really know what they're doing. You just need to find someone with their guard down. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time and you can get into anything. You can call a Fortune 100 company and talk to their accounting department within the first few minutes of reaching their main line. You don't necessarily call the customer service line, but you call one of their offices and you say you're so-and-so from a different office and you're traveling in town, you wanna to connect with someone, so forth, can you connect me to them? They talk to someone else's assistant. Uh, you have information from the last conversation you have and you just work it. It's the old kind of con game that you play in those types of things. No technology whatsoever. 
and you can walk out of there with uh, a user account. You can get an access to their wireless networks when you're coming in for the quote unquote meeting later that day or saying that your boss is coming in. It's extremely easy. Dressing up in a FedEx outfit, which is basically a shirt and a pair of shorts and carrying a box and walking into any organization, you'd be surprised how many buildings you can walk through and how many security desks you can bypass or carrying a bag of subs that you're bringing in for a lunch order, things of that sort. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. What we need to do is we just need to be getting people to think through what's actually happening and looking to see what are the things that just don't really make sense and questioning it. It's not our common or base nature to do that. It is to be helpful, let people do their jobs and things like that. And you certainly want to do that, but you want to have your, your line of sight on that. And it's, you know, I hate to use this example, but you got to kind of think about some of your data and your assets kind of like you would with your kids. Um, if you're watching your kids playing in a playground and you see someone coming over and talking to them and things like that, because it's your kids, your suspicions go up very quickly. Under other circumstances, same person walking by may not really think about it. You've got to think about that with anyone who's accessing or coming close to your data, your information, or your, your physical offices, not as much at the moment, but and those are things that need to be challenged and double check. And just taking someone's word for it or that they're wearing a uniform that's got a logo on it doesn't necessarily mean that you should trust them. If someone calls you up and says they're calling from a credit card company or they're calling from your mortgage and you're about to be repossessed, that's fantastic. Go ahead and call your call the mortgage company that you have. Double check and see what's happening. Just because someone calls up and says, hey, this is who I am and this is what I do. And even if their caller ID shows up with it, doesn't mean that that's really who they are. Spoofing those things are extremely easy and you don't need a lot of technology to do it. Right. Okay, let me let you move on. All right, so we, we kind of covered, so I'll go through this quickly, the phishing and fraudulent sites. So things that you want to get people to click on and go to, common scenarios are people looking for money, they're raising money for social causes. To, that if you support this, click on here and sign a petition because this is real important and we need to show that people are supportive of it, things like that. You need to know what you're really doing. And again, you may feel very strongly about these things, and these are very important to you. You've got to make sure that what you're interacting with is actually who you think it is. And following things that lead you down a path, kind of like following the trail of breadcrumbs, probably not the safest route to go. Pick some different paths. Use other ways to find out who are these entities. And I can contact them. If they're reaching out to me, that means that they want to interact. So they should be able to find them through other means and make sure that they are who they say they are and going through that. And what we find is that these ransomware malware uh, issues start with someone clicking something. They open something they really shouldn't have and that causes the problem. And again, it's when people are busy, when they're not thinking through things, so they're doing it first thing in the morning or late at night. Um, and one of the considerations is for, with remote work and everyone having multiple different devices, there are different tools in the mix there and then different things protecting you or trying to protect you at any given moment in time. And so your presumption of having something to look out for you may not be valid at every point in time. So things, as we talked about before, we need to make sure everyone's aware of. So the initiating event, like we said, it's usually someone clicking on something or entering something into a site or allowing a download to happen. The short of it is it's a user initiated thing. For the most part, the major vectors right now are not things that are being directed and forced into things and people quote unquote breaking in. It's people sending things in through innocuous channels and getting someone to take an action that's initiating these. And it's hitting about the weakest link, which are people. People are the weakest link in this because they are not always paying attention. They're not always thinking through. They are reacting without cross-checking, things of that sort. And the numbers are pretty high. Phishing attacks, which are emails that are sent to someone from um, a, a bad actor of some sort that's trying to get them to do something, click on something, visit something, what have you. Right now, it's tracking about 90% of the data breaches that are out there across industries. Um, statistics on how many of fraudulent emails are actually open, so they're not necessarily caught by filters, they're not immediately deleted, is about 30%. Um, if any of you do email filtering or have teams or folks on your teams that do email filtering, if you ask them how many things are blocked, it's probably a very large 
number. Um, and that's great, but things do still get through. And of those that are getting through, there's still a pretty good percentage chance that someone's going to open it and do something with it. And the folks who want to do bad things realize that. And since, again, it doesn't cost them anything to send these things out, they just keep sending them out. And by law of averages and the statistics on it, they're going to be successful a good amount of the time. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that people have some level of mindfulness or awareness as we were talking about, and they understand that there is some accountability on their part. Uh, we find a lot of organizations, especially when they have robust uh, security infrastructures, that people think, well, I don't really need to worry about this because someone else is, they're taking care of it. And that doesn't work. You need to protect everything that you're doing yourself. As we were using the playground analogy, you know, you, you can't, uh, if there's, if your kids are playing and you think there might be something wrong or a threat to them, you don't hope that a police officer comes by or something like that. You take immediate action. Again, different things, not the same thing, but that type of thought process and way that we think things through should be used when we're protecting any other asset as well. And we, one of the things, and in sophisticated organizations, you don't want to promote the reliance on your IT or help desk, again, because it promotes that someone else is going to take care of it. Make sure that people realize that they are accountable for things things. They have responsibility to do certain things and steps uh, themselves, and it's not someone else that's going to fix that for them. So you want to make sure that you reinforce that with your teams. One of the big things with that is that when you're talking about things like training is you want to make sure that you're focusing not so much on memorization, but mindfulness. I'm sure you've all taken various types of cyber training courses where they talk about, well, here's an email that's coming from someone who says they're a sultan of something or other, and they have all this money and they need to move it. If you'd be kind enough to send them your bank information, they'll send this stuff to you. You get to keep a percentage of it, and they're very appreciative. And we've all seen that plenty of times. That first uh, type of email tactic originated in the early days of email in the mid-90s, and that's fine and great. Um, but it desensitizes people because they look at it, yeah, I've seen this a thousand times, not a big deal. Instead, you want to try to do things where we're training people is to talk through what kind of business do we have? What do we do? How do we interact with the public? How do we interact with partners? And then how could people exploit that? And let's think through some scenarios so people can start to say, ah, yeah, okay, I kind of get that. What if someone does walk through the front door? What if someone calls up? What if we get an email asking us to do something? Maybe we work in um, various types of high transaction things and we send lots of wires out. What if someone sends a wire that looks a little off, but it looks a little okay for a deal we're trying to close? What are the steps and actions we should take so that we don't disrupt our business, but we also don't fall prey to a potential scam of some sorts. Okay, so some mindfulness examples. What does that kind of stuff mean? Uh, like we were just talking about, you want to find things that are examples based on the actual job and task people are doing. And that means you need to look at what what is your business and thinking that through. There's plenty of great resources on the internet and not knock them. You can download them for free and people can take courses on that stuff. But what's very helpful with your teams is to take those and say, how do these apply to us? And what kind of would be a practical example for us and how we do business and focus on that. Um, next thing is it's the think before you click with it, whatever it may be with clicking on something, downloading something, um, visiting a site and typing information in. Have you, can you verify who that is? Do you know who you're dealing with? And it's, it's more than just looking at the display name or the address in the bar. Are there other ways for you to make sure that that's correct? Maybe it's calling them up and saying, hey, did you send me this? Using a different channel than what they contacted you on. Um, thinking about what they're trying to get you to do. Is it uh, something where they're saying, this has to be done. This is very important. You got to do this for me, whatever it may be. Those are indications. Certainly, they could be real and legitimate, but they may not be. And you want to make sure that you're doing some level of verification with that. So now we're going to talk a little bit about plans, policies, and procedures. But let me pause before we go into that. Any questions thus far? Okay. So plans, policy. Oh, wait, 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 sorry. wait. Sorry, I was having trouble turning my speaker back on. Um, yeah, Chris, so um, just want to do a little time check here. We're at 840. So how many slides do you have left? Uh, I think we have about six. Okay. Then I think I'm going to hold the questions for the end and let you, okay. let, you uh, let you go straight through. Go ahead. So plans, policies, and procedures. This probably sounds like consultant speak, and it kind of sort of is, but 
for any business, um, you want to have some structure to how your organization deals with things. You probably have it with how people deal with accounting, how people do with human resources. You need the same thing around security and technology infrastructure. Uh, plans are basically ways to capture what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, what needs to go into it, what do you need to uh, have in place and practice before something happens? What do you need to have in place so it's available when something happens? So things like business continuity planning, incident response, uh, your maintenance of your infrastructure are very important to make sure those things get done when they're supposed to and that these things happen on a regular basis. These are plans for what you're going to do today, this quarter, this year. It's also plans for what you're going to do beyond that. And as you move past this year and you go into the beyond that part, you have those things that you can then address and start to get on the list to take care of. Policies and procedures, I'll just change the terms there in there, but policies are things that talk about what an organization wants to do for things like security and privacy and things of that nature. And procedures are how people should do that. Uh, these don't need to be complicated, but if you don't say for your organization, this is what we do and this is how we do it, you're taking a bit of a leap to expect that your employees and your partners and teammates and things of that sorts know what it is that you wanna do or how to do it. So these don't need to be long, complicated types of things, but short basic things that explain that kind of stuff can be very helpful to make sure that everyone's moving in the right direction. System and network hygiene. I won't walk through each of these and uh, folks, and I'm pretty sure they'll send a copy of this deck out to you so you'll have it as well. But these are all some things that are basic things you want to make sure that you're doing. And if you haven't checked on these, if you have a great set of IT folks, that's fantastic. But ask them to just double check. When you get onto an airplane and uh, they, uh, the pilot and co-pilot are getting ready to take off, they go through a checklist. They've done it a million times. They know exactly what it is, but they have to go through each one and check those things off. It's to make sure that nothing's overlooked and you don't have any problems. You want to treat your system and network hygiene in a similar standpoint. You want to make sure you go through these things and make sure that you uh, are doing them. One of the ones I will highlight are things like multi-factor authentication. Um, when you have basic two-factor authentication, like a user ID and password, if those things are compromised, anyone who has that and knows what, they, what systems they're to can use them. When you have multi-factor, you're adding additional elements to that. So it's not just something that uh, identifies you and something that you know, but it's something that you have with you, for instance. So um, if you have a smartphone and you work with uh, applications like Authenticator or uh, Secure ID, things of that sort, it'll either give you a token or have you log in when you try to log in with a user ID and password, which means that if someone was trying to get into that system, they'd have to have your user ID, password, and that device. Uh, there are other things like that, and there are many ways to do it. The more things that you add on to that list, the harder it is for someone to be able to have all of those things and actually be able to use anything that they've stolen from you or that's been compromised. Oops. Sorry, I have the wrong section here. Okay, um, some response steps. So what do you do when something has happened? Coming up with a plan for what you're going to do and thinking about it before it happens is always very valuable. Trying to figure out what you're gonna do when something is actually happening can be tough. So when you have something like malware or ransomware, there are some things in here, the list of things you can do, is you do wanna make sure you can isolate systems. You don't necessarily want to turn them off, but you do wanna make sure that what's ever on them cannot spread. Um, and you wanna take some actions. If you, these are two technical steps for you, you certainly wanna call in someone who can help you with these things. Uh, if you have internal resources that can help you with this stuff, you want them to do that. That. One of the things is you want to make sure as soon as you think there's a problem that you do your best to contain it and understand what you're dealing with and keep it from spreading. And you also want to protect to a degree the evidence that you have in case there is a response that you want to take. So to the point about not powering down, that may not be an option to any on the circumstances, but it, when things cycle and they go power up and power down, there's lots of things that are happening within those machines that give the opportunities for software to do certain things, to get rid of certain things, to hide how things happen. So you want to do your best so that you can make sure that you're not for allowing any further exposure or damage to yourself, but also giving you ways to uh, come back from that and make sure that you can go after 
other uh, entities that might be the, the ones that have targeted you, if at all possible. So again, some basic steps here and certainly things that you can go and take a look at and adapt for your own organization. But the big thing here is to make sure you think through some of those things and make sure that people know what's expected of them. And that gets back to that policy and procedure piece. Tell You want to say that we do have some things that we want to do when there's the potential of malware or ransomware, and these are the steps that you take when you think you might be having a problem with that. One of the most effective things we find with going through some of that stuff too, and as people have plans for dealing with this stuff, but whether it's malware, um, ransomware, dealing with business continuity planning or disaster recovery, are things like tabletop exercises. These are relatively simple. These aren't full exercises where you have to involve things turning up, transferring to other systems or what have you, but just walking through plans tend to be very, very helpful. Having someone lead it as an exercise and have people walk through it, it quickly identifies as to whether how in-depth is a plan or how general is it. If we actually have a scenario that we're dealing with, if we were to pick up this plan, how helpful would it be in knowing what to do, when to do it, how to do it, who to engage? Um, also, by inviting people to that session, you'll find out very quickly, do we have all the right people? Do we have the wrong people? Are there other people that need to be here? Um, if we're saying that certain people are going to do things, can they do that? Do they have the ability to perform those steps? Again, those are things which you can deal with when there's something happening, but it's best done beforehand so you can be properly prepared. And in the midst of a event or disaster or whatever it may be, it's challenging to focus on these things. So you want to take the time and energy to do this. These don't need to be multi-day events with you spend a lot of time and money on. It can be simple type of 30-minute, one-hour exercises to go through these things, and you'll find they're very helpful, and it'll help get people thinking in the right mode. And back to our, uh, our thoughts earlier about awareness and mindfulness, those all help people run through those scenarios. It starts to create those synaptical patterns in their head, so they start to see how these things can develop. And keep a much better eye out for them in day-to-day -day work and operations. So just some best practices too. So uh, CISA, the, the FBI, HS uh, say don't pay ransoms. And if anyone ever asks us, we say the same thing. You absolutely do not want to pay a ransom. It's the same way that you are uh, paying a bully your milk money type of thing as a little kid. Although, as my kids tell me right now, milk money and lunch money is not a thing anymore because there is no money transaction in the schools, but uh, hopefully most people get the reference. Um, what you do want to do is make sure that if someone does come in with ransomware and they locked your stuff up, that that's not your only avenue. You want to look at backups. You want to look at having uh, separated backups that are tested and ready to go. So if for any reason something's compromised, you have a way to get that stuff back and make sure that you're not having further exposure. Maybe I'll pause there, Robin, if you want to go into some of the backup questions that folks had. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I think the questions were just around um, uh, backup, but but I think more specifically about cloud storage, because I mm -hmm. think a lot of us are um, we're trusting and relying on Dropbox and, and the, you know, the cloud storage places to keep the data safe. So how, um, first of all, what are the recommendations uh, regarding using cloud storage? Um, and secondly, are we being, uh, are we missing something by just relying on them and saying, I don't have to worry because Dropbox has all of that uh, safety protocol in place? Well, without talking about any particular offering, um, not all cloud offerings are the same. So when we say cloud storage, um, in general, a cloud strategy is something we strongly encourage, especially for small businesses, because there's no way you're going to build the level of infrastructure, controls, and things of that sort on your own. Um, there's no competitive advantage to doing so. So you leveraging the cloud is is the best way to go. You will get more robust capabilities, you'll get better controls, better monitoring, resiliency, and all that stuff. Now, you want to pick your partner the right way. You want to look at what do they do, how do what services do they offer, what do they guarantee and put into their offers. You'll find that organizations that provide very little detail on what they do to monitor, control, and guarantee things, um, 
may not be the ones to do to sign up with the ones that do have that information it's in, in you know, when you're looking online and you're going to a website you got to drill down into the legal docs and such but you want to see this these are the things that they promise you these are the service levels that they commit to these are the things that they attest to those are the ones that you want to use um, we one of the things we do with a lot of our clients is utilize things that are packaged with uh, known commodities so for instance Microsoft uh, Microsoft Office 365 accounts. They provide cloud storage as part of the accounts and utilizing that properly in the controls around the Office 365 infrastructure can be very cost effective, give you very robust controls and a fairly effective way. One of the things though to also keep in mind is there is a difference between backups and the resiliency of the cloud. So when you put things in the cloud, cloud fabric by nature has redundancy built into it. So it's, it's not like one computer and if it goes down, you're out of luck. There's a number of different things going on within that fabric and your, your data and information is available to you through a lot of redundant capabilities. That being said, that's not really a backup. A backup would be something where you take and it exists somewhere else and it's secured with some level of access controls, encryption and things of that sort. And then if you ever needed it, it's a separate source for you to bring that back. So you do wanna look at storage in the cloud uh, differently than backup in the cloud. Uh, and the level of what you need to do with any of that stuff certainly is something you need to look at from each organization. But as opposed to having a tape backup and a computer down the hallway in your office and organization, organization, moving to the cloud or leveraging cloud resources is an excellent way to go. But with everything, you need to make sure you know who you're dealing with and you understand how your stuff is being set up and look at the differences between just plain old cloud resiliency and real backups. Okay, great. Um, so we are at 8.52. Um, I know you have a few more slides and we've got a lot of questions coming in. So question here, um, if we run a few minutes late, are you able to uh, do that? Unfortunately, I cannot. I have another commitment at nine, so I do need to go. And I can sum up the rest of these slides in about 30 seconds if you want to do that. And we can go to questions. Okay. So just five quick things to do um, after this session. So we talked about these going through this, things like training and think about awareness training for folks. So they're really thinking about things and seeing what it means to me and what it means to me in this organization, doing some of those cyber hygiene checkups, make sure you do have backups and you test them, having some plans and, and, go, and having roles and responsibilities of what people are supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to do it. Uh, and doing things like exercises, go through a drill, take 15 minutes out of a staff meeting and say, let's talk a little bit about what would happen if someone called at two in the morning and said, hey, it looks like we can't get into any of our systems or all our systems are down. What are the things that we do? And run through some of those types of exercises. Um, I want to show you these links here. These are three really, really good resources for small to mid-sized businesses. MITRE, is a project of the federal government um, and their attack site is something that gives you information about what's going on by industry, by industry uh, organization size and all the things that are out there. It gets into some detail that you may not be overtly interested in, but if you just yeah. want to plow through it at a high level, it's a fantastic resource. And if you want to get into the technical nuts and bolts of what's actually in those and that list of ransomware, for instance, I put at the beginning of the deck, you can get into the nitty gritty details. So it works on a number of different levels. The other, uh, and I mentioned this earlier and I neglected to spell out the acronym, but CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, is a wonderful resource of everything from training, hardening information, uh, generic uh, resources and things like that uh, for organizations of all size. Would highly encourage you to visit every so often. Certainly anyone on your team uh, that deals with your technology infrastructure should be aware of it. Another great one is HHS, and that is healthcare specific, but HHS has done a real good job. I, I, we could have put other things up here like SBA and stuff like that, but my personal preference, I think HHS has done the best job with breaking things down as exposure to things at big organizations down to one person uh, doctor office type of setups. Um, they have some great resources. They have checklists. They've got tools. They have things to use with third parties and agreements. It's all there. Obviously, when you're downloading a template or 
something from the internet, you need to make it applicable to your organization, but it gives you some context and a starting point. But these are some of the three best resources that we like to recommend to folks to take a look at and make sure they've got in their list of uh, drop down um, bookmarks for things on cyber. So then that's, we can wrap there and go straight to questions. Okay, terrific. Uh, all right, we got five minutes, um, and I need to give you a minute to wrap up. So I'm going to just take a couple of these ones that look like shorter questions. Um, one question here coming in. What is the best way to ensure that using a VPN connection is secure? Uh, most VPN technology is pretty similar. And so if you're using someone's VPN, unless you have somehow connected something that's being run by a very sophisticated entity that is uh, spoofing you into a VPN, you're going to be in decent shape. VPNs basically uh, tunnel the connection that you have and give you protection for what you are sending through it. Now, like with, as we mentioned before, you should know who you're getting your VPN through, and there are open source VPNs, and there are VPNs that are offered through commercial entities out there. Just because it's open source doesn't mean that it's 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 less secure or less good. You just need to make sure you do your research on it. And when you are using your VPN, you need to make sure it's on. And there's usually two versions of VPNs that you just need to be aware of. There are VPNs which take all your traffic through your uh, operating system and route it through that VPN. And there are ones that do it for select traffic and select applications. So you just need to know which kind you're using. And there may be a reason for you to use one or the other where you're doing certain things like browsing the internet and doing things for work, you might want to use a tool that gives you some sort of bifurcation of your traffic versus using something that does all your traffic. It's just understanding what it is. And some of the write-ups can be a little bit esoteric when you look at the descriptions of their service. But typically, if you do a little bit of searching around, you can get uh, some information from other sources to talk about the pros and cons of the various tools. And you can make sure that you're getting something that works for you. But in general, VPNs are great. They help to make sure that people can't pick up your data and if they do get some of it they can't really make use of it okay um all right i think we got time for one more here and i like this one um so what are the um what are the initial response steps to do if a private home becomes infected with ransomware well, if, it's, if you've got ransomware, one, you need to take a look at what resources do you really have on your home that you now no longer have access to. And it, presuming in this scenario, you don't have any other backups, um, you got a little bit of a problem. What you do want to make sure of when you're dealing with a private home is that if you clean something out, and this might be more malware versus ransomware, you, but with both, you want to make sure that you're also checking all devices. If you look on your home network, you'll probably notice that you have a lot of things connected in. It's probably because your TV, your alarm clock, your refrigerator, or whatever else it might be, is also talking to your network. And devices like TVs, they have Android operating systems for the most part. They are uh, great targets for putting malware in a ransomware that sits there and hides. So if you do clear stuff off your network and you clear off your machines, that's fine. You need to make sure that you get some tools to also scan those other devices and the things that you don't sit in front of with a keyboard, like your TVs, like your alarm clocks and any other connected device that you have. And if you don't know how to do that, it is worth going and getting some assistance to make sure that you clear those out. Because after you take all the steps to get rid of or to address something that you have as a problem or restore backups or what have you, you can find out you have the exact same problem three weeks later or another variant because something was hiding in a different place. For people who are in office, same thing happens with things like photocopiers uh, and those smart document center types of things that are printers, scanners, and all that other stuff. They have operating systems and they you don't typically put uh, anti-malware type of software on them. And so it's a place where that stuff hides. So if you do something, take an action and clean things up and go through all that, you could be facing it again just because there was another variant or another version of it hiding in wait in it. So you do need to be very careful with that. Okay, so that uh, is all the time that we have this morning. Um, Chris, this has been fascinating. Um, it's always scary uh, to... Uh, uh, you know, focus on this. Um, we know it's out there, um, but this uh, this certainly helped us uh, increase awareness. Um, if uh, if people would like to um, contact you, 
separately to ask for some questions or find out about your consulting services, um, you'll provide our, you, it's okay for us to provide your contact information, correct? Sure, absolutely. And yeah. very much appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all this morning. I hope it was helpful and good luck with everything. Yeah, it was excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, right, thank you. It back to you, Bert. Thank you, Robin. Chris, thank you so much. That was just fascinating. Um, I think we could have been here another two hours uh, talking about this, and maybe there's an opportunity for a more involved workshop at some point in the future. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thanks. Well, if we do that, I'm going to add to the other comment. I'd like to do it when we're in person because, you know, I heard the food and beverage is very good at your session. So try to do that one. Okay, we'll try it. We'll try and do that. And a good excuse to come down to the Cape. Uh, enjoy your Friday and enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.